on ratio analysis. All right, in terms of ratios, where, what are we talking about? We're going to take information from our financial statements, primarily, well, in our case, specifically from our income statement and balance sheet. From those two different financial statements, we're going to create liquidity, asset management, debt management, profitability, and market value ratios. All right, liquidity ratios are sort of short-term solvency. Do we have enough current assets in place to meet our current liabilities? The current ratio is defined as that ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities. We're going to express that as a times, and we'd like that times to be bigger than one. We want to make sure our current assets in place are big enough to cover our current liabilities, our short-term liabilities. A um, more stringent version of that test is what we're going to call the quick ratio. Sometimes it's called the acid test ratio. Um, from that, we're going to deduct inventories from our current assets. What if we've produced something and no one wants to buy it? Do we have enough other current assets in place to meet our current liabilities? Um, and that's going to be expressed as a times as well. All right. Um, in terms of these numerically, I think back to the data you had from financial statements where we had current assets of 300, current liabilities of 150. That ratio, 300 divided by 150, is two times. So that's pretty good. Uh, the quick ratio, current assets of 300 minus inventories of 100. The numerator is 200 divided by 150. That's 1.33 times. So that's still pretty good. Um, in terms of these liquidity ratios, you want them to be bigger than one, but how much bigger is somewhat subjective. If they're too big, you're kind of being inefficient. If you have like a whole bunch of cash sitting in place, you've got a real high current ratio, but you're not using that efficiently. So how much bigger than one is subjective? How you would know if it's a good ratio or a bad ratio needs some sort of perspective. Sometimes one of the ways we'll gain that perspective is looking at the ratios across time doing trend analysis. The other way we'll gain perspective is through comparison to either a specific competitor, an industry average, some form of benchmark. And we'll talk about that shortly. All right, in terms of our asset management ratios, we're going to look at three. And again, there's plenty of ratios we could create. We're going to focus for this class on these three, inventory conversion period, average collection period, total asset turnover. All right, in terms of inventory conversion period, we're going to take a balance sheet item, inventory, and divide it by a income statement item, cost of goods sold. Um, since cost of goods sold is per year, we're going to divide that by 365 for turn it into a per day basis. That's so like cost of goods sold per day. And that makes it more comparable in terms of a ratio. Inventory over cost of goods sold per day, we're going to express that ratio in terms of days. How quickly does it take something we produce to turn up being sold? And we want that to be a smaller number. The smaller, the better in terms of inventory conversion period. Average collection period, accounts receivable over sales per day. This is basically how long does it take us to get paid. Sometimes this ratio is referred to as day sales outstanding. And again, the smaller the better. We'd like to get paid sooner rather than later. Now, this varies by industry. In some industries, it might be perfectly acceptable to have 90 or 180. Some industries might be five. It sort of varies by industry. This is where we'd like to have some sort of industry benchmark or competitor benchmark to know if our ratios are good, bad, or headed in the right direction or not. Okay, fine. So both of those lower the better. Total asset turnover, we want the higher the better. We want our sales divided by total asset. We want to use our assets efficiently. We want to turn those assets over and over and over at a higher number. And we're going to express that as a times. All right. These debt management ratios, uh, payables deferral period, time interest earned, total debt to total assets, and equity multiplier, um, they're somewhat subjective. A payables deferral period, that's how long does, do we take to pay? Now, we got to be a little bit careful here. We'd like that to be longer, but we don't want to, we, we want to pay our debts. So we don't want to let something be outstanding past its due date. That would be unethical. However, with electronic payments, there's no reason to necessarily pay something early. We could have it automatically deducted on the due date. That would be most efficient use of our funds. Have it in our use as long as possible to make the payable deferral period as high as possible. Um, one other thing to be aware of, and we will talk about that here in a little bit, um, sometimes you do get a discount for paying early, in which case, well, heck, we want to pay, go ahead and pay early to get that discount. And we'll calculate those costs of whether it's worth it or not to pay early as opposed to have use of those funds over the full collection period. All right. These other ratios, time interest earned, we obviously want to be bigger than one. We want to have our EBIT big enough to cover our interest expense. 
How much bigger is kind of a relate, depends on how much relates to how much financial leverage you want to have. And all these are somewhat subjective. The general gist of these debt management ratios are the more debt you use as a percentage of your asset, the higher your multiplier is, your equity multiplier. So if you have more debt, you would have less equity and this equity multiplier would be a larger number. We'll see this equity multiplier more explicitly in terms of how it amplifies the return on equity. And as owners, as share owners, that's, that's good. We want a high equity multiplier. Um, however, it's a double-edged sword. If, we, if we're losing money, it amplifies our losses. But if we're making money, it amplifies our gains. So the use of debt is a little bit tricky. It amplifies returns for the good or bad. And if you borrow a whole lot of money and don't have, have a bad year, uh, it could force bankruptcy. So if you don't have a time interest earn ratio bigger than one, that's not good. Um, we'll look at this again, but it's all these ratios. We're going to express time interest earn equity multiplier as times and then total debt to total assets as a percentage. And this is where a uh, closer look at the overall perspective picture of the firm over time and relative to competitors is useful. It, it, there's no hard and fast rule to say this should be 50 percent or 20 percent or 30 percent. It varies by industry. Airlines typically have a very high debt ratio in that they have tangible assets that they can borrow against. So if they can't pay it back, you get a plane. Whereas like a mining company, if you dig in a hole in the ground and don't find anything, there's nothing there to pay back your debt. So it's very hard to borrow money in that type of industry. So mining industries might have very low debt to assets. All right. Um, in terms of profitability, this is simple enough. The bigger, the better for all three of these. We want high profit margins, high return on assets, high return on equity. So, and we're going to express all those as a percentage. The, these ratios will actually give us our decimal version, but we'll express it as a percentage. So, for example, 20 over 100 is 0.2. We would express that as 20%. And we want the bigger, the better for profitability. We're only, well, the specific market value ratio we're going to look at is price to earnings price to earnings per share. As a preliminary calculation, I've got earnings per share, which is our bottom line net income divided by the number of shares outstanding. That's how much profit per shareholder. And then our price to earnings ratio is gonna be expressed as a times. It's how many times over are you paying earnings? One way to think about it is how many years of earnings would it take to pay back to justify that price? So if your earnings were two and the stock price were 20, the price earnings ratio would be 10. So if you get $2 a year for 10 years, you get your initial price back. Now, typically speaking, companies that have high price to earnings ratios are growth companies. You're not hope if your price to earnings ratio is say 20, your earnings are two and your price is 40. Um, that's, that's a long time to get paid back. You're assuming that company's gonna grow. That two's not gonna last long, it's gonna turn into a three and a four and a five in the future. So typically companies with high price to earnings ratios are considered to be growth companies. Whereas companies that have low price to earnings ratios are value companies. That is they have a strong stable profitability but they don't have uh, a whole lot of growth opportunities. So again, the comparison is somewhat subjective. There's not a hard and fast rule as to what price to earnings should be. It's more of what the market perceives the company as being either growth or value. All right, so based on the data we had from financial statements, we should be able to plug that data into a balance sheet, plug that data into an income statement, and use that data to calculate these ratios. So what we're gonna do because we kind of forgot about it in financial statements. So let's do this in Excel. So here we go into Excel. Now I have typed into the balance sheet the information that was given. So this was given at the bottom of page one in our financial statements notes. Cash, accounts receivable, inventories, and so on. So everything in the yellow cells is given to us. So it's an input or assumption cell. Same with our income statement. That's the information given to us. On this ratio tab, we're gonna calculate the column C, the actual ratios, but we are provided with two points of comparison. What this ratio was last year, and then what our industry average is. So in some sense, we'd like to see, well, are we headed in the right direction? To do that, we'd compare this year with last year, and then to figure out if we're better or worse than an industry average, we would compare it with the benchmark. Generally speaking, there's more than one benchmark you could use. You could use an industry, you could use a specific firm, and then typically for trend analysis, you would use more than one year. 
but for what we have for column E and G, we've got enough to at least do both. All right, so let's see. Here's my balance sheet. It's not balanced. I've got all these, all these yellow cells. How do we get current assets? Well, we're going to take B6 cash plus B7 accounts receivable plus B8 inventories to get 300. Now, I get, here's the important thing about our spreadsheet analysis. We do not want to type in the number 300. That's no use as a, a spreadsheet. We want to have our spreadsheet set, set up such that if we change an assumption cell, the formula cell will calculate for us. So all formula cells will be blank or clear or white, um, whereas input cells or assumption cells will be yellow. That will be the format we use throughout the course. All right. In terms of net fixed assets, we have to remember where we see this word less, we're deducting. So the process I'm going to use throughout the semester is input all of the data in positive format. So accumulated depreciation is listed as 100. However, to get net fixed assets, we're going to take Property, gross property plant equipment and subtract accumulated depreciation to get our net property plant equipment. And down, down here, our total assets, our current assets, plus net fixed assets. So we're off to it, we're off and running. Uh, you might need to pause if you need to double check what the formula is in the cell. The formula bar is up here, so I'm going to go pretty quick completing these sheets, but you could. Pause the sheet to look what is the formula in any one white cell. All right, for current liabilities, we're going to sum together cell E6 plus cell E7 plus cell E8. So accounts payable plus notes payable plus accruals. For total liabilities, we're going to take our current liabilities plus long-term debt. For common equity, we're going to take common stock plus accumulated retained earnings. And then total liabilities and equity will be total liabilities plus common equity. All right, so we got a balance sheet that balances. We're off to a good start. All right, looking at our income statement, a lot more formula cells here. Um, here's our in information. Here's something to be aware of. This information over here in columns D and E, that's typically not reported on an income statement itself. A lot of times this information will be reported in the notes to the financial statements. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to list it here. It's going to be given to us in one form or another in terms of creating a sheet. And then we're going to use this information to calculate some of these values. All right, for EBITDA, we're just going to take sales and subtract out costs of goods sold and other expenses. Oh my goodness, that's a subtraction symbol there. All right, and then to get EBIT, we're going to take our EBITDA and subtract out not equal, subtract out, depreciation and amortization. All right, moving right along. This is the trickiest cell we got. Are you ready for this? All right, we're going to calculate our interest expense. We, we The sheet's set up such that we can have different rates on short-term debt and long-term debt. And that's typically, when we talk about interest rates, we'll see why we would walk the idea of having two different interest rates. In today's current environment, being 2020, we kind of have a fall yield curve, like short-term rates are not that much different from longer-term rates. But generally speaking, there's usually differences. For our purposes, in this example, they're both 8%. So 8% of my notes payable, that's interest expense, and then 8% of long-term bonds, that's interest expense. All right, we're gonna need to use these interest rates and though that information from the balance sheet to calculate our interest expense. We're gonna be jumping from this sheet to the balance sheet and then jumping back. In order for Excel not to get too confused, we want to jump as few as times as possible. So I'm going to do as much as I can over here while I'm on the income statement. I'm going to say interest expense is equal to cell E8 or E6 multiplied by. Now I'm going to jump to the balance sheet and grab a hold of notes payable. So I jump to the balance sheet, grab a hold of notes payable. So I got E6 times balance sheet E7. I'm going to put the plus sign and grab my notes payable. That's long-term debt. Grab my long-term debt. Okay, so just to reiterate, we got that interest rate on short-term debt times notes payable plus my long-term debt. And I'm gonna multiply that by, I'm gonna jump back to the income statement to get that long-term debt interest rate. So jump back to the income statement, click on the interest rate on long-term bonds and hit enter. And there's that 20. You say, heck, I could have done that in my head. 8% of 50 plus 8% of 200, that's 4 plus 16, that's 20. Why couldn't I just typed out 20? The reason we don't want to just type in the number 20 is that 
as these assumptions change, that value will change. We've got it set up now such that when these yellow assumptions change on both sheets, this is automatically going to calculate for us. Now you may say, huh, I did that and nothing, it did not work correctly. Try it again. The check figure is here. There's no good way for me to do this for you other than follow that sequence. Do as much as you can on one sheet, jump to the other sheet, do as much as you can there before you jump back. If you start jumping back and forth, it gets the, the computer gets lost and it gets haywire. But in any case, there's our check figure 20 for interest expense. Earnings before taxes will be EBIT minus interest expense. All right, taxes. Here's another calculation. It's going to be relatively straightforward. We're going to take earnings before taxes and multiply that by our flat tax rate. Easy enough. That's a simplifying assumption. Generally, there's a whole department calculating our tax expense. We're doing it by taking EBT times our flat tax rate. All right, we're ready for what's referred to as a bottom line. We're going to take earnings before taxes minus taxes to get net income. We're going to take it two steps further. We'd like to figure out out of our profit, or just how much are we going to pay in dividends? We are going to take our shares outstanding, multiplied by the dividend per share to get our dividends. And then to figure out how much addition to retained earnings is there this year, we're going to take our net income and subtract out dividends. All right, there we go. We now have a balance sheet and an income statement such that we can change the yellow cells and they'll automatically recalculate for us. This is actually going to be very useful in our spreadsheet assignment that is due or is the assignment from this module. All right, we're, this is basically, we're just now caught up with where we were supposed to be from financial statements. We're talking about ratios now. Okay, we're ready for this. Um, the fact that these ratios are going to involve jumping around um, similar to the way we did with interest expense. They're usually not as tricky. Let's see if we can do this. All right, for a current ratio, we're going to say it's equal to, jump to the balance sheet, current assets divided by current liabilities, and then hit enter, and we, it takes us back to two. All right, 300 divided by 150 is two. And we can see that's a bigger number than last year. It's a bigger number than our industry average. For the most part, we're in a good liquidity position. Um, what about quick ratio? We're going to take I'm going to put in the parenthesis ahead of time, equal parenthesis, jump to the balance sheet, current assets, minus inventories, close the parenthesis, divide by current liabilities, 1.33. All right, both of these would indicate they're sort of headed in the right direction, they're getting bigger, they're not super large, we're not too concerned about that, and they're better than the industry average. So good liquidity position. All right, what about our inventory conversion period? All right, are you ready for this? All right, we're going to say we want inventory from the balance sheet, and then we need cost of goods sold from the income statement. So let's see. I'm going to equal sign, jump to the balance sheet, and grab inventory. Then divide, put a parenthesis, jump to the income statement, grab cost of goods sold, and divide that by 365, close a parenthesis, and hit enter. 365 days. It takes exactly one year for us to produce a good and sell it. All right, that sounds like a lot. However, that's better than last year, and that's actually better than the benchmark. So that's good news. Okay, good news there. It's a, that's sort of industry specific. That could be terrible if the industry average is 30 and we're at 365. However, um, given the industry average is more than a year, we're doing it in a year. That's good. All right, average collection period. Let's see. We're going to jump to the balance sheet and grab accounts receivable. And then divide that by parenthesis, jump to the income statement, sales divided by 365, close the parenthesis and hit enter, 121.67 days. That sounds like a long time, however, that's better than last year. It takes us fewer days than the year before and takes us fewer days than our benchmark. So again, that's again industry specific. It's definitely headed in the right direction. We want that to be a low number and that's lower than last year, whether that's a good number or not, we need a point of reference, and our point of reference is, in this case, is going to be the industry average. All right. The total asset turnover, we want a bigger number. So last year it was 0.45. Our benchmark is 0.4. We want it to be bigger than 0.4 for sure, and ideally bigger than 0.45. All right. To get total asset turnover, we're going to grab, so let's see, we're going to jump to our income statement first and grab sales and then divide that by 
to the balance sheet and grab total assets. And whoa, how about that? We're turning our assets over even more efficiently than last year. So 0.5, this is a good company. This is looking good, good liquidity, good asset management. Um, can't tell for certain what's going on with these final categories, but so far so good. All right, in terms of payables deferral period, let's see, we've got, we need to grab accounts payable. So we're gonna jump over here, grab accounts payable, and then divide that by parentheses, jump to the income statement, and grab cost of goods sold over 365. Close the parenthesis, 182.5. All right, we get the gist of it. I'm wondering, I'm gonna give you the other check figures because we don't wanna spend the entire time working here. And then if you need elaboration on how to calculate these other values, you could email a copy of your sheet to your instructor and they could provide the details. But I'm gonna provide you the check figures for the rest of these values as opposed to calculating all the rest of these. So let's see, for time interest earn, we're gonna get 7.5. Total debt to total assets is 41.67%. Equity multiplier should be 2.4. Profit margin on sales is 26%. Return on assets, 13%. Return on equity, 31.2%. Earnings per share is 78 cents. And the price to earnings ratio is 19.23. So you've seen the process. Now go ahead and See if you can't calculate those check figures. All right, so back to the notes. That sort of concludes page two. Um, and we've talked about this. Here's what we wanna do with those ratios. Trend analysis, comparing across time, looking for patterns, um, and then benchmarking, comparing your ratios with an industry average right here. There are some limitations to ratios. Uh, different sources have different definitions. That's one of the advantages of creating the ratios yourself is you know what values you're capturing to calculate the ratios. Um, a couple of things to be aware of. It's hard to know what your what should be your benchmark for a conglomerate. Is General Electric an industrial company? Is it an energy company? Is it a finance company? It's hard to know um, because that's a conglomerate. Um, and then average isn't necessarily good. You want to be have a better ratio than the industry average or your peer. Um, sometimes seasonal factors will come into play, especially if you're using quarterly financial data as opposed to yearly. You might have different periods, like every fall is a really good quarter and every spring is a really bad quarter, or different stages of the business cycle can create different ratios. If you're a, um, a recessionary company, you might do well in recessions and poorly in expansions or vice versa. So in any case, seasonal factors can distort uh, ratio comparisons. Um, Timing, I'm not sure if that's really explicit. Not all companies in their fiscal year, December 31st. So if Target, and I'm not 100% sure if this is exact, but let's just say Target ends their fiscal year, December 31st, and Walmart ends theirs January 31st. Um, when we look at the balance sheets, those aren't the exact same point in time. When we look at the income statements, those are not the exact same 12 month period. So it's a little bit, it's more difficult to make comparisons when they're not exactly identical. And then accounting practices can vary between firms. Some might use LIFO for inventory, some might use FIFO for inventory. That creates different values for inventory for that matter and performance measures to, in cost of goods sold and profits. All right, so just to be aware of, uh, to get our feet wet. We don't need to be experts on this at this point. We do wanna be experts on the ratios in this class and be aware of some of the limitations. All right, here are some of our favorite breakdowns of these ratios. Um, return on assets is net income over total assets, but suppose we find out that's worse than the industry average. Well, what are we doing wrong? Um, DuP the DuPont equation breaks return on assets into two components, the profit margin and total asset turnover. So is it a profitability problem or is it a asset management problem? Or it could be both for that matter. Or if, they're, if it's higher, it's better than the industry average, it could be because of we have really low costs, we have really high prices, or really efficient using our assets. Uh, we'd like to know that. So this breaks it down. What is referred to as an extended DuPont equation or a modified DuPont equation looks at return on equity. Two ways of thinking about it. It's return on assets times the equity multiplier or it's profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier. So equity is multiplied by our choice of debt or equity to finance our assets. If we use a lot of debt to finance our assets, 
it amplifies the return. Now, as long as the profit margin is positive, that's good. But if the profit margin is negative and we're amplifying it, that's not so good. So the use of debt could be good, could be bad. We'll talk more about financial leverage later on in the course, but that is a way of breaking down return on equity. All right, so those are two profitability measures broken down into subset ratios. Uh, we could also be interested in working capital management or short-term asset management. Um, here's a new definition, cash conversion cycle. And we're gonna calculate it as, here's sort of a verbal definition, but for ratios, we're gonna add inventory conversion period, plus average collection period, minus payable deferral period. It's basically how long does it take from an idea to turn into money in your pocket? Uh, we gotta produce it, we gotta sell it, we gotta get paid for it, and we're gonna defer our own payments. How long does that take? All right, um, here's some examples for the cash conversion cycle given different values. There's check figures provided. If you need additional details, that's where you would email your instructor. And then one other topic, I think this has got to be getting near our last topic. Yeah, this is our last topic of our ratio analysis um, it relates to working capital management. This is our accounts payable. Sometimes we're going to talk about trade credit, stuff that we've bought but haven't paid for. It's in effect short-term debt. We bought it, haven't paid for it yet. We're in effect borrowing. Um, what's not clear here is probably these this terminology, 1 slash 10 net 30. We'd say that's 110 net 30 or 215 net 45. What does that even mean? This means you get a 1% discount if you pay within 10 days. Otherwise, you got to pay the full balance in 30 days. Whereas 215 net 45 means you get a 2% discount if you pay within 15 days. Otherwise, the full balance is 45 days. Okay, so that's sort of a the terminology or what that shorthand means. We could use that information to calculate a nominal cost of trade credit and an effective cost of trade credit. This is in effect how much interest we are in effect paying if we use the full 30 days or we use the full payment period, if we avoid the discount. It's kind of like an opportunity cost. We're not explicitly paying it, we're just giving up a discount. So it's a measure of opportunity cost. And so here's the formula for calculating it, discount percentage over 100 minus the discount percentage times 365 divided by days credit outstanding minus the discount period. So we basically have like a periodic interest rate times the number of periods per year. On an effective basis, we're going to take one plus the periodic rate and raise it to the number of periods per year. In effect, compound it and subtract one. All right. So here's an example, calculating the nominal cost with a check figure, calculating the effective cost with a check figure. If you run into difficulties with obtaining that, let's just verify that using a calculator. All right, let's see. Here's a calculator. Let's see if we can't verify this 27.86%. Let's see if I can get everything on the screen at once. How did I do this? This should work. All right, here we go. Oh my God, come on, let's move. There we go. Okay, here's the problem. VK Industries sells on terms of 215 net 45. 2% discount in 15 days. Net is due in 45 days. What is the effective cost of trade credit? Apparently, we're supposed to get 27.86%. All right, well, what's the periodic rate? We want to take this 2 and divide it by 100 minus 2. So 2 divided by 98. That's 0 0.0204. We want to add one to that, plus one. So that's one plus the periodic rate. I'm going to go ahead and store that so I don't forget it. And the reason I want to store that is because there might be some other decimals over here I don't see. So I've got this, now I need to raise it to how many periods there are per year. To get that, to get this power I'm going to raise it to, I'm going to take 365 and divide that by, I'm going to put a parenthesis, I'm going to divide 365 by the full credit period, which is 45 in this case, minus the discount period, which is 15. So mm, I'll put the parenthesis, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. So I'm going to say 45 minus 15, it should be 30. So I'm going to say 45 minus 15, close that parenthesis. 30, okay, gotta skip the step. All right, so I got 365 divided by 30, that equals 
12.1667, and there might be other decimals floating around here I don't see. I'm going to store that value. So I've calculated, I'm going to store that as 2. All right, so I've calculated the two relevant portions. I'm going to recall 1. There's my thing I'm going to raise this to. Here's my y to the x key. Raise that to, and then recall 2. Raise it to that power. So 1.0204 raised to the 12.1667 power, and I get 1.2786. Subtract 1 from that, and I got 0.2786. That's 27.86%. Whew. Thank goodness it worked. All right, let's close that, but that is, and that seems pretty cumbersome, but that is the process for calculating, or that is the process for using, let's see if I can get this to work again, that, that formula, that is putting into practice that, those, that information to calculate. Now, given that number, I would suggest to you, if that is the effective cost of trade credit, what is probably in your firm's best interest is to pay early and take the 2% discount. If you say, nah, we're just going to wait and pay in 45 days, you're in effect paying 27.86%. And it's hard to imagine that you, the investment you're making is going to earn 27.86%. If you can't find projects to invest in that earn that higher rate of return, it's probably worth it to get that rate of return implicitly by paying early and getting that 2% discount. Now, that, those numbers change if this period is net 180, that discount's going to be much smaller. That cost of trade credit's going to be much smaller. If that's a 1 instead of a 2, that cost of trade credit's going to be smaller. So it's worth calculating to know, should we be paying early or paying on time? And we're going to rule out the thing paying late. We're going to say not do that. Don't do that. And we're going to either pay on time or pay early. And in most cases, when you calculate the effective cost, the bigger that number is, the more likely it is that you should pay early. All right, there are plenty of questions and problems here with check figures provided. There's another mergent exercise listed here. I'm going to give you the check figures for the mergent exercise. For, I'm going to give you for Cooper Tire first. For return on equity, 6.66%. Current ratio, 1.92. Interest coverage, uh, 7.52. Total asset turnover, 1.07. For Discover, return on equity is 24.9. They don't have reported a current ratio. They don't have reported interest coverage. For a financial services company, those are not relevant industry or ratios. So some of the ratios we've calculated and are going to say our go-to ratios aren't necessarily useful in certain industries. So in Discover's case, these are just blanks. They don't exist. And then for total asset turnover, we get 0.12, which again, is not necessarily super meaningful for financial services, but that is the number reported in terms of looking it up on Mergent. Uh, the one question I got, or I got two questions for you. If you look at Mergent's historical ratios, and these again are for 2018, um, is there a trend in return on equity? And I would suggest to you that there is. Uh, the return on equity for Cooper Tire from 2015, 16, 17, 18 is going down. That's a bad trend because we want return on equity to be a bigger number. The other question I got for you is I got two companies here, Discover and Cooper Tire. Does it make more sense to compare Cooper Tire with Discover or with GT? Well, what's GT? Turns out GT is Goodyear Tire. And again, this wouldn't be, it doesn't make any sense to compare Cooper with Discover. They're in different industries. It's not relevant. What it would be relevant to compare Cooper Tire's ratios in terms of profitability, asset management, interest coverage, liquidity, with Goodyear Tire, another tire company. So we want to be aware of that. Sometimes comparing one company to another is not meaningful. Okay, that concludes our discussion on ratio analysis. As you come across questions, email your instructor. And in terms of using a spreadsheet, make sure you attach the spreadsheet to your email so that we can both be looking at the same thing and have access to the same underlying formulas. All right, good luck with your ratio analysis.